Okay, well, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our last speaker for today. So uh, that's uh, Alwyn Scali. So Alwyn is a uh, group leader in the Department of Genetics at the University of Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> he is now, uh, work, work, as I mentioned, working in, in human genetics, but he began his, his career actually in theoretical physics, studying the Orion Nebula cluster, I think. That's right. Yes. And, um, but from there, he's, he's moved into um, large-scale uh, genetic data in humans, primates, great apes, Neanderthals. Um, really interesting work on mutation rates and also uh, some, some assembled the gorilla genome for the first time. And um, so his talk today is about chance and ancestry in human genetics. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak, and I've really enjoyed um, the whole day so far and looking forward to tomorrow. So hopefully I can keep you entertained just for one last um, session before dinner. Um, I'm going to talk about ancestry, and I'm, uh, ancestry as, uh, focusing on ancestry as geneticists uh, understand it, but also uh, more broadly how it's understood and represented um, uh, in sort of wider society and some of the issues around that. Um, so Fisher does crop up as he does in nearly anything connected with uh, population genetics. Um, so I'll touch on him and ancestry is certainly something that, that he and his generation um, uh, thought a lot about. Um, but in truth ancestry is something that uh, I think has been important in societies all over the world and throughout history um, to some extent or other. And, uh, and here's a nice colorful example. This was a genealogy, uh, a form of ancestry, a representation of ancestry uh, prepared for Henry VIII, showing the genealogy of his, uh, of his son, uh, all the way back from Adam down through Noah, uh, King Uther Pendragon. It goes on for about 35 pages like this. Um, and uh, today, people, you could argue, are even more um, kind of uh, aware of concepts of ancestry and the genealogy industry now is, is a, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, with millions of customers doing these uh, DNA ancestry tests. Um, there's a number of important reasons why this individual is not actually a Viking. <laughs> but I think this does kind of illustrate the approach that a lot of people come to ancestry with. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's, it tells them something about themselves, perhaps. Uh, and it's also a bit of fun. But there are other aspects to this, um, to ancestry uh, and to these kind of ancestry tests. Um, so you can see uh, the, the presentation of ancestry as a, a set of categories with percentage rep representation in these categories or labels. Uh, and also the other um, thing here, which I think uh, is important to note and, and actually is a source of um, uh, sort of anger actually for many people is the the use, perhaps the sort of rather casual use in this advertisement of, of uh, indigenous ancestry. Because ancestry is something which isn't, well, for some people, and particularly in indigenous groups around the world, um, it's something which uh, relate, it, 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 it's involved not just in their identity uh, and culture, but also in political uh, and economic issues for them. And they're trying to navigate this very difficult um, landscape, and these companies kind of throw a grenade into it in this way. And so we'll come back to to this um, uh, sort of view of ancestry later. Um, but before I go on, I want to kind of be clear and define what I mean by ancestry, because there are obviously, um, like any term or like many terms, multiple meanings. And there are certainly in, in the wider usage, uh, there are concepts of cultural ancestry, uh, things to do with, with um, heritage, traditions that have been passed on, uh, through families or societies, uh, uh, religions, uh, and those are ancestral things. And I'm going to focus as a geneticist on biological concepts of ancestry. Um, and I'm going to begin by trying to distinguish between two different forms of ancestry. Um, uh, and that distinction turns out, I think, to be quite important um, and instructive. So there's the concept of genealogical ancestry and uh, more narrowly, genetic ancestry. So you probably can't quite read that because this light is on, but uh, 
that says genealogical ancestry. And what do we mean by genealogical, what do people mean by it? Uh, in, se in a sense, it's where most people probably reach, uh, go to when they think about what they mean by ancestry. It's, it's your family tree, uh, the people who are direct biological ancestors of you. So your parents, your grandparents, great parents, etc., going back um, however far you want to go. Um, most people's family trees probably look something like this, but not everyone's. So here's a family tree of George Darwin, who was one of the, the children of Charles. And his parents, Charles uh, uh, Darwin and Emma Wedgwood, were first cousins. They shared a grandfather in Josiah Wedgwood. And as a result, George's family tree, it looks a little bit more sparse uh, in this, uh, towards the middle there. And actually, this is not so uncommon uh, in societies and cultures around the world uh, and s sections of society and history. But probably most people uh, have a family tree like this. And if you were to say, uh, identify a couple of your great grandparents as being of a particular ancestry category, maybe they were uh, Italian, you'd be uh, justified in saying that you're the one quarter Italian. And people kind of use their family tree uh, as a basis for, for making statements like that. And sometimes people trace their way back to uh, is this running out of batteries, or am I failing to press the button? Yeah, it's not advancing for me. Thanks. Um, sometimes people trace their uh, ancestry back to, to a particularly significant, uh, uh, notable, or wealthy, or otherwise important individual several generations back. Not always kind of appreciating or recognizing that this is one of uh, 30 or 64 or however many um, ancestors there were back at that time. Um, and of course, as one goes back through the generations, the number of ancestors doubles and doubles. And so if you're talking about an ancestor of yours in the, in the 18th century, a genealogical ancestor, that's one of several hundred people, and a, a generation being roughly about 30 years. And that's something actually that's been, been kind of true and seems to have been stable for, for a long time in, in, in human evolution, actually. Um, and we can keep going back, uh, and now the y-axis in here, this is the number of potential genealogical ancestors you might have, is now in units of millions, and when you get back to sort of 20 or 30 generations, that's back to the, the, the 12th century, you've got hundreds of millions of potential uh, genealogical ancestors, which uh, seems like a very large number. And it is a large number when you compare it with the estimated global population back then, uh, which was substantially less than that. So the implication then, of course, from this is that, is that everybody, uh, everybody at that time who had any descendants today uh, is in your family tree. So we could have a, a graphical representation of that. Here's, uh, say, this gray area represents the, the population, let's say, of Europe going back in time. Uh, and if there's some individual, individual A, this red um, shape shows, shows his or her genealogy uh, family tree growing and expanding and filling the whole population around about that time. And if that's true for one individual, well, it'll be true for any other, other one. And so all of our, uh, our family trees merge and are, become identical uh, around about this time in the past. Um, and that means uh, that anybody alive before then, so Charlemagne, for example, is in everyone's family tree, if they've got European ancestry, and all the Vikings, uh, and Cleopatra and, and, and whoever else you want. So um, I think that's, you know, that's something which some people are aware of and some people aren't, but it's, it's quite an important thing to think about when in some contexts uh, for genealogical ancestry. Um, so what about genetic ancestry? So by genetic ancestry, now I'm talking about the, the actual uh, inheritance of DNA from your ancestors. And that turns out to be a different um, thing. And to see why, we need to just kind of recapitulate a bit of uh, basic genetics. So everybody uh, shares, uh, everybody has two copies of each chromosome, one that they've had from their father and one from their mother. And so what we'll do is trace the ancestry of one of these chromosomes, say the, the, the maternally inherited one, back uh, through, the, through this pedigree. Um, so this whole chromosome, it's the maternally inherited one, so it all comes from the mother. Um, 
So we'll color, if we color the mother blue, we can, we can color this chromosome all blue because all of that material has come directly from her. But that mother uh, inherited, or well, the chromosome that she passed on was actually a mixture of DNA from her two parents. And that mixing was done um, by a sort of a random process of, of, of shuffling and splicing together bits of the two chromosomes she'd inherited. And so when you actually trace A's ancestry back to the maternal grandparents, it's not necessarily a, an even split. There'll be a little bit, for example, in this case, the left-hand bit of this chromosome goes, goes back to the, uh, the maternal grandmother, and the right hand goes back to the grandfather. And the same thing happens the next generation back. Uh, the same kind of process of splicing together. It's called recombination. Um, and here you now you can see, so this is A's ancestry of, of his or her um, maternal great-grandparents um, uh, in this maternally inherited chromosome. So which bit of this chromosome has been inherited from which maternal great-grandparent? And back uh, again, another generation. And at some point, what's going to happen is that this process of, of splicing and random kind of cutting uh, is going to end up excluding uh, DNA from one of these ancestors. In this case, a couple of them have been excluded at this uh, fourth, fourth generation back, the blue one and the green one on the right. So you can see that there's a, a number of chunks of ancestry, but it's no longer necessarily the same as the number of genealogical ancestors. And as you go back, the same thing happens um, repeatedly. And what, happen, what effectively, the number of genetic ancestors is increasing linearly as you go back in time, whereas we saw that the number of genealogical ancestors is doubling. Um, so at this point, on this particular chromosome, there's lots of individuals back about six generations ago who are not genetic ancestors um, there. Now, of course, there's a whole bunch. There's 21 other chromosomes, and I'm ignoring uh, X and Y. They've got a different mode of inheritance. But just focusing on those, the autosomes, uh, there's lots of other opportunities for these people to have contributed for the process to have included material from them. So on average, six generations back then, you'll still expect most people to be a genetic ancestor. But if you keep going further back, you get down to sort of, uh, you get up to, to thousands of genetic ancestors, maybe um, back in the, the 17th century or something, so 12, 14 generations ago. At that point, it actually starts to become quite unlikely that a genealogical ancestor, if you pick a random genealogical ancestor, that they'll be a genetic ancestor as well. So yep, Charlemagne is in your family tree, but it's very unlikely you've got any genes inherited from him, uh, whether or not you, just in case that's disappointing. Um, so how does Fisher um, relate to this? Well, to understand that, this sort of um, distinction between genealogical and genetic ancestry actually goes back to a fundamental d debate and dispute um, at the beginning of genetics. So I'm going to do a little bit of um, amateur history, which is a bad thing to do in the presence of actual historians of science. But the, the story sort of goes, um, and people will be familiar with most of it. So Gregor Mendel, his experiments were being, had been rediscovered uh, at the end of the 19th century and championed by this chap, William Bateson, who was here in Cambridge, um, and republished. And of course, Mendel's experiments um, oh, well, Amongst other things, they showed examples of this kind of thing, where if you cross two um, forms of a particular species, this particular flower, uh, the off offspring might not, rather than being some sort of mix, some sort of light pink color, uh, in this case, they're actually all of one kind. So that could happen. And then also, when you did the next thing and crossed those, that generation back together, you'd find sometimes this recessive white trait reappearing. And as Bateson pointed out, that can only really happen if um, the, the germ cells, as he said, of a hybrid or crossbred are, are pure, uh, being carriers and transmitters of either the one character or the other, not both. So that's consistent with this idea of, 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 um, of genetic ancestry, where if you actually look at a single position on the chromosome, you're tracing back a single lineage through this tree. You're not kind of somehow um, inheriting lots of all the individuals, all your ancestors at that point. But it's when you get to the mother, you're either getting the grandfather's version or the grandmother's version. And a similar thing happening on the other side. And the, the combination of these two alleles is determining, these two variants, I should say, is determining what's happening. Uh, and so it might be that color is affected by the particular variants at this locus for this plant, uh, and then following the logic of this inheritance. So that's great. 
The problem was that there were other traits that didn't for, behave like that, uh, where it really did seem like actually, yes, it, it, you needed to consider all of your ancestors, uh, your parents, and if you also included your, um, added the effects from, from grandparents and everyone on your family tree, that that actually did a good job of explaining the trait in you. Uh, and Francis Galton, was the, was, was, uh, his research was devoted to kind of to demonstrating this. And here's a, a, a plot that he made from this he, in his book. He showed in his book, Natural Inheritance, showing a regression of height uh, in offspring on the, the average of the parent's height um, and showing how this all fitted very well with this uh, idea of, of actual sort of um, uh, blending inheritance, essentially, of your ancestors. Um, and this was associated with um, Charles Darwin um, as an idea, uh, because he had also had to uh, he, he'd also conjectured a kind of a blending form of inheritance to try and explain uh, the, the mechanisms behind his theory. And if it looks like I've put uh, Galton and Darwin here on the same family tree, that's because they were uh, they were cousins. In fact, when you start looking at the history of this subject, everybody appears to be cousins. Um, so in this case, however, not like this, because Galton himself had no children. Uh, they both they, they were first cousins. Uh, and this remarkable uh, poster, published by the Eugenics Education Society in 1926, um, shows this family tree. Uh, uh, the Darwin up there at the top now is Erasmus Darwin. So uh, uh, Charles, uh, so um, is sort of a. Someone said there was a no pointer here, but. Charles is sort of about halfway down, and, and, and Galton's on the other side, the one with no children uh, to the right. What's particularly amazing about this, well, so there's things like they've characterized people as brilliant, and then others as merely having scientific ability. Uh, and then everyone, and other people as other normal children. It's kind of amazing because this, when this was published, uh, Leonard Darwin, one of, who is one of these in, um, in this long row at the bottom, or sort of near the bottom, uh, one of Charles Darwin's sons was president of the Eugenic Society. Uh, so it's not clear which one of these he was. Um, uh, on the left, you can work out that, that, that the square there, brilliant, um, uh, would, would have been George Darwin, whose tree I showed before, because he had four children. Um, I'm guessing that the scientific ability was probably Charles Galton Darwin, his son. Um, of course, one of the other normal children is Gwen Raverat, who's uh, the famous artist author of period piece far more, um, probably by most people's estimation, a more brilliant and talented, certainly better known person. Uh, uh, so um, one wonders what Leonard thought, um, which one he thought he was, or did he design it himself and take the names off? Anyway, um, so this was obviously, an in, this was a particular trait that Galton was, was interested in, uh, the inheritance of ability. Uh, the no use of normal is, is particularly um, interesting too, given that uh, Darwin himself was acutely conscious of the, the, the risks attached to his own cousin, first cousin marriage, his own in ill health, and worried about ill health in his children. Um, anyway, so this debate between kind of the Mendelian approach and uh, what was known as the biometricians, uh, or um, sometimes the Darwinian inheritance approach, um, was effectively resolved by uh, Ronald Fisher, really, when he, by pointing out that actually it's all consistent with a Mendelian genetic um, framework if you have the, allow that some traits are a product not of a single locus but of many across the whole genome. And he worked out um, the mathematics of that in this amazing paper, really, uh, in 1918, uh, uh, the correlations between relatives. Um, and, and in doing so, essentially founded population genetics as a sort of he brought together these two um, what was original? What had that time was sort of this crisis, this uh, disagreement between these two camps, um, resolved that dispute really, um, and in the next over the next kind of decade, developed uh, this uh, these ideas in this field. Um, so that's this difference between um, genealogical and genetic um, ancestry, and I suspect I suppose actually I should probably point out before I proceed. Um, that uh, this structure here on the left in white, which is a sort of fundamental structure, really, of, of, of population genetics. It's kind of the thing that many of our methods are focused on trying to infer. Um, and it's 
uh, effectively, this is what we refer to as an ancestral recombination graph, uh, a version of this. Um, in many ways, we're even less able to, 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 to infer that, actually, the details of it, than the or genealogical ancestry for which at least there are, in some cases, uh, you know, historical records and pedigrees which are kept over many generations. So inferring genetic ancestry is actually, uh, to some extent, even more difficult for us to do from genetic data. And I don't think most customers um, of... Uh, of DNA testing services are going to be particularly concerned with those kinds of distinctions or those issues at all. And I think it's, it's fair to say that people do want something. They are interested in knowing uh, and associations of their ancestry with, with historical and geographical categories. Uh, and they would like to see something uh, along these lines. This is definitely providing us uh, some information that people want. For, I think... It's important to know, first of all, what actually are these numbers and what do they represent? And then we'll talk about some of the problems and issues perhaps um, associated with this way of thinking or way of presenting ancestry. Um, so a simple kind of version of what's going on when, one, when you take your sample or send it into one of these companies is, is as follows. You send in your genome, your sample or other, and they sequence it, and they look at, and this cartoon here, which again, I'm hoping people can just about make out, is um, a series of different variants, different positions on your genome. So it's sort of an abstract representation. They may be uh, different patterns of variation at that particular position, and different colors correspond to different variants that you might be carrying on your, uh, uh, a bit of your genome. And that's then compared to other copies in the uh, other sequences that this company will have in their database and in other data elsewhere. And so they might look at the individuals in their database that are currently living uh, here in Sweden, we can call that Scandinavian, um, and notice that a lot of these, pa these variants are shared with people there. Uh, but not all of them. This pink variant, for example, is only is found much more frequently in, in, in this Italian group, Southern Europe. And so, essentially, on the basis of um, these kinds of comparisons, and there'll be some uh, sort of clustering approaches which uh, come up with these numbers, but uh, there would be a, a, a determination made that your, your ancestry is 80% uh, Scandinavian and 15% Southern Europe, with Italy and Sweden perhaps in brackets. Um, and the implication, I think, for most people is that they will have ancestors in these places, uh, which may, tr may be entirely true in many cases, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, that pink variant, for example, could have come from some other population, an older population, perhaps in Anatolia, wherever, uh, and have passed from there into people living currently in Italy, and also separately via some other group of populations to you and to your ancestors. So, so you have some shared ancestry with people in, in Italy, and it might be very closely uh, um, related in some cases, but in others it might not be, particularly if these numbers get quite small. Um, and so it's quite possible for you to not have any Italian ancestors at all by this kind of comparison. Now, I'm simplifying the methods that they use to a certain degree, but this illustrates a certain problem with thinking about ancestry in terms of these kinds of categories. Uh, it really lends itself to thinking about, thinking about it in a very static way, as if these categories are fixed, um, not just today, but also in the past. Um, and obviously, there's an older, long-standing tradition of thinking about human groups and races in these kind of um, tree-like, um, very kind of static to, um, way where once diverged, these things remain diverged. And this is an example you might not be able to make out from um, uh, uh, an Australian uh, anthropologist, um, Graf uh, Smith, in 1924, where he shows the, what was then uh, uh, had become the sort of traditional categor categorization of humans into, I think in this case, he has six. The number varies as usually between four or six different um, races or groupings of, 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 uh, of humans. Um, and I think it's fair to say that this was the framework in which Fisher and his 
generation of, 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 uh, of geneticists and biologists uh, approached thinking about, um, uh, approached the, the, the idea of differences between human groups and how, how they thought about them. And there's lots of historical research on this and um, that Jenny referred to, exa for example. And in fact, um, the discussion around the UNESCO uh, statement is very revealing and very interesting in this context. And Jenny's paper in particular is a great place to start. Um, and I think one problem with this is that then it led them into talking and thinking about uh, concepts of innate differences between groups uh, that were ultimately, I think, quite misleading. Um, but one should also say that these sort of models are not, they're still used and still presented today. And I know that because this is one I put in a paper a few years ago myself as a sort of a, a simple model um, to, in order to help me talk about something um, in the history of, uh, of some human populations. And it's not, it's, I think it's important to also say that there's nothing inherently wrong with having a model which is, which is deliberately simple. Sometimes it's exactly where you should start. Uh, you know, you can work with it and then you can build it up and you can add things like, and I can add lots of migration events and see how that changes and I can sort of work with the data that way. At the same time, it's also fair to say that um, thinking about um, ancestry in this way does implicitly make these kind of gene flow and migration connections between populations. It sort of implicitly has them as unusual or, uh, or perhaps even rare events. Whereas the reality is that that's not true. They're, they're, they're effectively the norm. And if you look at what we've learned, particularly now that we have ancient genomes from all over the world, a lot of them admittedly uh, in Europe, um, but elsewhere, particularly in, in Asia too. Um, what we've seen is that actually gene flow around the world is really extremely common, sometimes very substantial, and sometimes quite rapid. And for example, here in, in, in Britain, uh, there, were, there, was, um, there was an episode of gene flow from the continent into Britain, which effectively replaced 90% of the, of, the, of the genetic ancestry uh, in individuals living here. Um, and similar things um, uh, certainly happen. When you zoom in to, to, to regions around the world, you get uh, a much more, still more complicated and intricate picture of, uh, of connections and movements between groups, um, and certainly not well described by a simple tree. Um, so the structures, and I think it's kind of, it's kind of useful to think about um, how geneticists approach um, dealing with this kind of concept, or how, how they approach trying to make sense of these kind of these complexities, uh, and how they kind of think about ancestry in this context. And so this is an example. Uh, this now, in particular, is something called an um, admixture graph. Perhaps it should be called an ancestry graph. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what, what, what all these things mean. And, but I should say, first of all, this is a relatively simple case example. Uh, complex, though it looks, you, there are much more kind of involved and difficult, um, um, messy kind of examples. And it's showing the relationships of shared ancestry between, in this case, multiple different gene uh, samples, um, both, uh, in, I think most of them ancient DNA samples, but you can also include modern samples and you can include multiple pop, um, groups in populations in, in these things. Um, and just to take a sort of a simple version of one, what we're showing here is you've got, we've got a, B, C, and in this case, O, a sort of outgroup um, individual or, or population. Are, these are all different um, actual genomes that we've got sequenced of. And what this um, structure represents is um, essentially it's, it's a graphical representation of the amount of the shared ancestry on, or, and of the correlations, genetic correlations between these samples. So that if we follow the various paths up to the root, uh, and work. So for example, from B up to the root, uh, uh, we could go to the left, which is, uh, has this kind of 90% um, uh, label on it, and all the way back up, and C has, uh, goes up to the root this other way. And you can see that they share this bit of ancestry at the top. And this, the amount of shared ancestry they have in this graph gives you a measure of how likely you are to, um, to see the same variant in, in, in individual B as an individual C. And in this case, because there's an admixture 
uh, event represented here where the two arrows come in to the, um, just above B. Uh, there's another route here where B could also go, but it's only 10% likely to go that way, and there's a little bit more shared ancestry that way. So this, what this, what this is not showing us is an explicit history of populations. So these internal nodes here don't represent necessarily some specific set of ancestors in some group. Obviously, for there to be shared ancestry, there must have been some ancestors. But they don't necessarily have to have been kind of in what people would otherwise imagine as being a coherent population, say, with some meaningful group of um, because of culture in the archaeological record or something like that. And indeed, if we were to add you know, another, go out and to add another sample to this, what that often does is tease apart structure and add lots more structure to this graph, um, depending on its relation to other elements in the graph. Whereas if this was really an explicit um, sort of uh, history of populations, then all we would do would be just add another branch to this kind of ancient ancestor up there. So, so really what's happening is that the concept of a population is actually receding from this. It's not present in this picture um, of ancestry. Uh, instead, what we're kind of, what we're representing here are mathematical relationships between samples and shared ancestry between them. Now, that's not to say that this is the best or the only way to talk about ancestry. And in particular, if we want to um, be able to relate genetic evidence to other evidence, archaeological evidence, um, say, or historical evidence, we are going to have to start talking about real populations that were in a particular place at a particular time. And so other models where we do have those concepts are going to be necessary in order to do that. Um, so there are multiple ways of approaching this. But I think it's fair to say, or it's true, that this is um, a, a truer representation of what we know about ancestry from the samples that we have of our kind of, um, of what we can measure. So does that mean that I think um, people, um, you know, if I were to set up a, a, a company proposing to send people admixture graphs um, for uh, where they stand in them, I don't think that would be a very profitable enterprise. And it's not what people necessarily want to see. Although maybe there is a version of that which, which people would like if it was kind of presented properly. I think that these sort of representations of ancestry where we have categories um, and people's kind of um, uh, quantities and percentages associated with them. Uh, it's not inherently a bad thing. Categorization is something that we inevitably end up having to do um, in most scientific enterprises in order to try and kind of break things down and make sense of things. I think people definitely need to be more sensitive about their, their use of certain ancestry categories and how they kind of present them. But I think if we are going to present ancestry in these terms, we do need to um, be quite clear and open and explicit about the limitations and implications of these, uh, this sort of way of presenting it. And so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of finish by going through what I think are some of the problems with presenting ancestry in this way that we should be quite explicit about. Um, the main one, I think, is that it understates this transience, this complexity, uh, and in fact, the ambiguity that we have about population structure in the past, that it's not a clear cut thing. And it certainly isn't the case that these categories are, um, uh, have some sort of um, uh, necessarily some, so, some inherent innate meaning uh, biologically. Uh, and that's kind of borne out by this our discovery that actually there was enormous amount of movement and variation between populations. Uh, so the consequences of, of that is that the set of categories and the set of labels that you pick is very contingent on time scale and that it implicitly sets a time scale as well. So if, if you pick as your set of categories uh, some populations that are relevant today, say in particular like if you pick a set of nation states or a set of geographical reason, re regions that seem obviously separate from each other today, that's uh, setting your focus on that particular sort of recent period of history. But if you were to go back you know, many thousands of years, those would not be relevant at all to human population structure. And, by, and reversing that 
you know, you could talk about uh, Neanderthal ancestry being an, an important category, which certainly would have been an extremely important description of human ancestry 100,000 years ago. But now, although it's interesting to people, is actually relatively irrelevant to differences between or to sort of the structure of human populations today. Um, it's also contingent on the data and the, what I've called the reference panels. Those are the sort of groups of people that you've got in your data set um, to compare genomes to. Uh, and uh, one way that this manifests is, for example, there are many parts of the world which are not well represented uh, in databases despite the large number of people um, that are present. Um, and your kind of ancestry categories that are assigned to you may be quite, um, will, be, will, will be a lot less accurate or will be more likely to, be, um, to misrepresent your ancestry if you're in an underrepresented category. Uh, and the, over the categories that are represented are often quite likely to be those ones where there has been, um, where there are, for example, a lot of people currently in America. So um, parts of the world where there have been, where there's been migration, um, forced or otherwise into America uh, will be better represented in these databases um, than parts where there aren't. And so in that sense, uh, these ancestry categories and the results that we get are determined by recent historical, social, um, and economic factors. Um, the other uh, important point which I raised before is that they do have an impact on ideas of, of people's identity and group membership. And there are many tribal systems around the world, tribal groups, um, where, these, where they're really trying to wrangle with these. And it's a really difficult problem. Um, so these concepts of blood quantum are still um, governing how a lot of Native American tribes are trying, uh, trying to assess uh, their membership. And some of them are using DNA methods, and others are rejecting DNA, genetic ancestry, as, as, as a way of um, identifying uh, membership of a particular group or tribe. And that varies around the world, and it has, um, like I said, um, very significant political and economic uh, implications for these people. And finally, I think it does encourage, if we kind of present these categories, and even more so if we all somehow sort of agree on a consensus set of categories to use, this notion that these, are, these emerge in some sense from the data themselves, that there are some genetic um, uh, fundamental reasons why categories such as Scandinavian or, um, or, or, or um, certain, uh, certain parts of the Middle East but not others uh, might be represented uh, as an ancestry category. And that therefore also that people's ideas about traits and differences between um, populations and that, these are, that there are sort of these innate trait values that are associated with some populations and others, uh, I think it does tend to encourage that sort of thinking which is also, I think, quite misleading. So those are the things I think we should be excited about when we are talking about ancestry, even if we aren't necessarily having to, to resort to this way of presenting and thinking about it. And I will finish there. Thank you very much.